Well, a, a welcome again. Thank you for coming out tonight. There are a few things that I want to just get out, out of the way right now. Um, what we're not going to be doing, uh, I had some questions. These are all real questions, believe it or not. We won't be following the Common Core curriculum. A lot of questions about that. <clears throat> we will be following the Hillsdale curriculum. We will not be teaching two state tests, as Dr. Hardings has said already. Uh, we will not be using digital devices to teach your students how to read or how to do math. Um, we will not be uh, indoctrinating students with political opinions or editorials. Okay, we're, we're, we're about education, not indoctrination. Uh, we're not going to use corporal punishment. Somebody asked a, a question about that. We have other ways. Don't worry. Uh, we are not going to crush our students with an extraordinary amount of homework. And we're not going to run the school like a military academy for wayward children. <laughs> I did think about starting that school, but I, I don't know. So I want to get back to this point about what makes us unique. What, why are we here? Why is this unique? Our mission is to develop the minds and nourish the hearts of our students through a content-rich curriculum in the classical liberal arts and sciences with instruction in moral character and civic virtue. So I'm going to keep coming back to this mission. And I'm going to pull uh, a few things out here to talk about uh, our curriculum. So it starts off with content-rich curriculum. So we believe that content matters. Believe it, believe it or not, in a lot of schools, there's really skills-based, college readiness, um, kind of whatever that means, without the content. Any kind of content can go in there. We believe that there's a specific kind of content. For example, history. We need to understand history. We need to understand geography. We, we, can, uh, we can learn a lot from literature. We need to know the fundamentals of reading and writing and communicating. Um, so it matters what we study. Content matters. Also, we, uh, the, the ways in which we educate also matter. Okay. So like I said, uh, we're not an anti-technology school. We'll be using technology, we'll be, but we, technology will not be a driver of the culture in the school. Okay. We also believe that teachers matter. I'll talk about teachers in a little bit. But also the tried and true methods. The tried and true methods is what we're going back to. And that encourages true education and forming uh, virtuous habits of mind. And I'll just read through a few of these. Uh, I might touch on some of them. Using pen and pencil on paper. Okay, so there's a lot of research about you know, the, the, the effectiveness uh, for actually writing things down. And uh, learning how to uh, print by hand, learning cursive. Um, note taking and annotation. So the students who are reading literature in our, in, a, in our school are going to have their own books. They'll be writing, they'll have a conversation with the author. I know that sounds a little weird, but they'll be taking notes in the book and on the book. And even at the earliest grades, once they learn to write, what we will be doing is t giving them ways to take notes, okay, so that they uh, are uh, developing these habits of mind. Explicit study of phonics, which I'll talk about, explicit study of grammar. Uh, both in English and in Latin, and cur uh, engaging class discussions, the use of storytelling, especially in history, uh, reading classic works of literature. You all have those folders in front of you, and later tonight you can take a look at our K through 12 curriculum, and you can see what the reading list is for every single grade. So if you have a fifth grader coming in, you know exactly what that fifth grader is going to be reading. Um, and they are, when I say classic works of literature, going all the way back to the Greeks and Romans, yes, but it's not all Greek and Roman, and it's not in Greek or Latin. Um, we're talking, you know, written in English all the way up through the 20th century. Um, studying primary sources, especially in history. Uh, the use of Socratic seminars and classical debates. Uh, and, and, and first and foremost, teacher-led classrooms. The teachers, again, are important. Content matters. The teachers uh, also matter. I'm also going to talk about a cohesive study of the liberal arts and sciences. What does this mean uh, to be cohesive? And finally, I'll say a little bit about our focus on virtue and the preparation to live a meaningful life. This is the question uh, that we're going to be asking even for our kindergartners from K through 12. What does it mean to live a meaningful life? Right? What does it mean to be a responsible citizen? And by the time that they get to senior year, they will, be doing a th they will all be doing a thesis, and the thesis is a semester-long course where they are picking a classic work of literature, and they are answering that question. What does it mean to, uh, what, what, what is it to, to live a meaningful life? 
and they're going to do that through uh, the, the, uh, an analysis of literature and then they have to present it to the entire school. This is done in all of the Hillsdale schools and I am told from, from other, you know, the other Hillsdale leaders that this is one of the highlights. In fact, it's, it's more of a highlight than graduating, the graduation ceremony for some of these uh, seniors. This idea of a cohesive uh, course of study starts with purposeful sequencing. So not only is it important what the students are reading, what the students are studying, it matters in what sequence that they do it. Three cycles of four years. The first is grades one through four, that's the lower school, and then five through eight, the middle school, and nine through 12 is the upper school or the high school. They are going to be exposed in grades one, five, and nine to the ancient world to 500. So this is historically uh, sequenced. And then second, sixth, and 10th, early European, then American, then uh, modern European, and world. Um, what this means also is that history, literature, art, and music all for follow this four-year cycle. So the idea here is that most of our first graders will not be able to read Homer's Odyssey, right? But they could be exposed to the ancient Greeks, exposed to who is uh, Odysseus, for example. Greek mythology and all that. <clears throat> By the time they get into grade five, they'll come back to that. They'll, under, they'll have that understanding of, uh, of, of where Greece is and what ancient Greece means for, for us. All right, so this cohesive course of study in grade five in February, for example, if your daughter is in uh, the fifth grade in February, she will be reading the narrative of Frederick Douglass in her literature class. She'll be uh, studying the American Civil War in history class and in music class, she'll be listening to the music of the Civil War era, and in art class, you'll be exposed to or maybe imitating the art of the 19th century. So all of these courses meaningfully intersect with one another. So if you're in education, this might this this is vertical alignment and horizontal alignment, alignment across the grade, and alignment from grade to grade to grade to grade, which to me makes a lot of sense. So it's not just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and kind of like this salad bowl kind of thing. We have uh, seven core virtues, and these are the traditional virtues. Everything that we do kind of goes back to this as well. Prudence, justice, courage, humility, gratitude, perseverance, and compassion. We are gonna hold our students to this standard. Now notice this isn't the Ten Commandments, okay? The Ten Commandments is good, but this isn't just what you shouldn't do, but this is how should they live, for example, um, they will be exposed to prudence or any of these uh, in literature. They'll also be exposed to it in the stories of history. And also, our teachers that are in front of the students will be modeling this. So we're gonna hold that, this, this, this standard up to, for the students, and also the, the, the teachers will be modeling this. Also, uh, I said teachers matter. Now, I wish I could trot out all my teachers right now, but I'm in the process, I'm the very early stages of hiring teachers, but I thought it might be good for you to understand what am I looking for? What is it that we as a school are looking for in our teachers? So I kind of think of this in three different ways. Functional literacy, cultural literacy, and moral literacy. So first is functional liter literacy is all of, the, all of the practical stuff. Can this teacher manage a classroom through the use of pro uh, procedures and routines? Uh, is, does, this, does this person like children and want children to succeed? Okay, that's kind of a threshold issue there. Um, are they, do they have a love for their subject or subjects that they teach? Are they lifelong learners? Do they want to continue to, to, to learn? Do they have the desire to stay up late at night planning in their first year, right? So they are going to be given a curriculum, but they're not gonna to be told what to teach or how to teach. They're gonna be given the, you know, the, the, the scope and sequence and they can use their own creativity in order to come up with uh, their own plan. So they need to be able to do that. The second is cultural literacy. Do they understand what classical education is or do they know enough and want to know more? Right? Are they able to articulate our, our mission? So I won't be hiring anyone who is not uh, in line with the mission. So you don't believe in that mission, there's no reason for you to you know, teach in this school. And then finally, moral literacy. Uh, are they, are they you know, people who we want to put in front of our, our students. Now again, this is important because they're going to be the ones who form uh, our students. They need to understand that they're going to play a very important role in the life of the kids who are in front of them. I'm going to talk now about a few aspects of the curriculum. One of the most important things that your 
child will be doing in any education is learning how to read. So we're starting off with explicit intensive phonics. We use a program called Literacy Essentials, which is based on the Orton-Gillingham method, and this is a multi-sensory approach to phonics. So it starts out with the individual sounds of the letters, okay, um, and it moves out from there. So we have cat, for example, and we're not using the whole language method, which uh, was kind of an experiment over the last 40 years and may also explain why we have a problem with reading in the U.S. In whole language, you would be given a picture of a cat like this, and then you would say, this is a cat. So you're recognizing the whole word. And when you see that word, you know that's cat. It doesn't work really well. I was talking to an educator recently, but she said when she was in third grade, she went to her local park, and there's one of those caution signs, right? And it said, no Thanksgiving. And she never understood why, she, when she went to swim in her local, you know, local park, why the sign said no Thanksgiving. She thought, well, maybe you can't have Thanksgiving in the summer. She didn't really understand. Well, she had learned by whole language. And what it actually said was no trespassing. But she was looking at the entire word and seeing it as Thanksgiving because she had not been taught to sound it out. Um, this is also a very engaging uh, class, this phonics class, student to teacher. It's interesting to watch. And then we get into grammar. How many of you uh, loved grammar when you were in school? It was your favorite, favorite subject. Yeah, there I we go. Really <laughs> you, usually there's one weirdo. <laughs> we have two this time now. No, I did too, but I didn't really realize it at the time. But grammar is so important. Grammar is also very, very difficult to teach. And so it's easy to take the easy way out and not teach grammar, right? Um, because we have Grammarly now. I've actually talked to educators who say, well, we don't really need to teach that because we have Grammarly. We don't really need to teach the kids to spell because we have spell check. Now, it sounds like I'm making that up, but I'm actually, I'm not. And um, we also teach grammar explicitly. For example, Katie, do you remember what a, 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 a gerund is? Yes, it's, of a, it's a verb now. Yeah, see? So you've got a brown noser in the front row. <laughs> yeah, so they need to, in order to talk about grammar, you need to understand the language of grammar, right? I can't say, you know, talk about gerunds if no one knows what a gerund is. Our students will know what a gerund is. I will, I, I'm not kidding. I, I taught high school AP English Lit for, for over a decade, and I had students say, Mr. Rose, wh what's a noun? And I, you know, and, I, and that just shows me that, you know, smart kids, they, they were not educated well in grammar. There's one way that I think is a great way to approach grammar. And when I was in seventh grade and eighth grade, I did this every single day, and now I love it. So here's what a sentence diagram looks like. You're trying to figure out, well, what is the subject and what is the predicate? And so none is the subject. You have of us, and that's a prepositional phrase that is not part of the subject. It modifies the subject, so you drop it down below the line here, and you have us. Us is plural, right? Now, if you remember that none is also a replacement for no one, would you say no one is ready or no one are ready? And now it becomes a little clearer, right? And so our students will be doing this, uh, beginning in third grade with some simple, uh, simple diagramming all the way through the eighth grade. We will also be reading the classics, and again, I urge you to uh, take a look closely at our K through 12 curriculum sheets that you'll find in your folders. It includes the poems, the plays, the novels, the short stories that, we, that we're going to be reading. Another tried and true method that we actually had to import from Singapore. Our K through 7 program is directly from uh, Singapore Math, and what's most interesting about this is one, K through 7, you're developing algebraic thinking so that when you get to eighth grade, you can tackle algebra and move on from there. So most of our students will graduate with either going all the way through pre-calculus or calculus. Um, it makes use of bar modeling in order to achieve this algebraic thinking. This is a real problem, a word problem, from a third grade Singapore um, uh, math text. And I've changed the names to protect the innocent. Uh, there are three cities in the county. Hillsdale is one half as large as Coldwater, which is six times as large as Janesville. The total population of the county is 14,000. How many people reside in Hillsdale? Now this is a pretty easy question, right? That's what I thought when I was first given this. I went on for five minutes and I couldn't come up with the answer. I'm sure you can. But these third graders can do this in two minutes. 
because they understand the bar modeling technique, Singapore math focuses, it really starts off with something very concrete, which is a word problem, and it, 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 it goes into uh, something that is pictorial, and then it goes into something that's abstract. So again, another tried and true method. History and geography, we've said a little bit about already. Um, we're, we'll, for American history, it's worth pointing out, we'll be using the Hillsdale 1776 curriculum, um, which is a very balanced view of the United States to uh, inspire our students to understand the inheritance that they have received. It's the good, it's the bad, it's the ugly. Their use of storytelling in history class is important. Also, uh, our students, especially as they get into the upper grades, will be using primary sources. Uh, so rather than you know reading a textbook that tells them tells you about what you know uh, you know Publius said you can actually read it uh, yourself there'll be an understanding of geography and I give you my geography pledge by the time that our students or your students get into ninth grade uh, if they start in the early grades that is they will know every country in the entire world they will know the capital of all of those countries they will know all of the states and they will know all of the capitals of the states. Now, that, we can do that as kind of parlor tricks because you can teach third graders to know all that and recite it all in you know, two minutes. It's pretty impressive. But it also uh, speaks to the method of classical education. When kids are younger, they can memorize and recite much more easily than, 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 than later. So they learn those facts or the geography, the basics when they're younger, and then when they get into the history later, they'll understand you know, the relationship between Northern Ireland and, and uh, Great Britain or, or the Republic of Ireland. Or, or we'll understand where, you know, Scandinavia is. Also, science is very important. The K through 12 curriculum of science, I believe, is one of the best available. By the time our kids uh, graduate, they will have taken upper level biology classes, chemistry, physics, astronomy, and they'll have the option of taking AP advanced placement in that as well. So this is not a STEM school where we're teaching application in the lower grades. We believe in knowledge for its own sake. In other words, if you learn about the human body, you're not learning that to get a job or to have a skill. You're learning that to understand about yourself and then the world around you. That's what science is for. And it's uh, also communicated through clear and concise writing. Also, the Latin advantage. In the fourth and fifth grade, uh, all of our students will have vocabulary classes where they're introduced to Greek and Latin roots. When they get into sixth grade, this is, will be their first full-fledged Latin class. And this is the equivalent to the first semester of a high school freshman Latin class. They'll have Latin one split between sixth and seventh grade. They'll have Latin two in eighth grade and Latin three in ninth grade. They can go on in the tenth grade and they can take AP uh, uh, Latin, uh, or they can decide in, in grades 10, 11, and 12 they want to go on to a modern language, which we will also be offering. This also creates a well-ordered mind and, and, and clear and concise thinking. So that's another. It also provides a key to the modern languages, especially the romance languages. Uh, improves reading, writing, and communication skills, um, and it also enhances uh, pro problem solving abilities. Also, I was, uh, I was watching a lecture recently by a biologist who teaches uh, at one of the big universities in Ohio, and he was remarking on those who had a Latin background did so much better in biology because they had already understood the terminology of science. The fine arts are very important to us. They're not extras. And this is a little bit different than most schools out there. Our students will have fine arts every single day of the year. So they'll either have a music class or a visual arts class. They'll alternate. Um, we believe that art and music are very important to a classical education. Again, they're not extras. They're, they, they, they kind of work with the history classes and the literature class all kind of goes together. They are also going to be studying in their art classes and music classes, art history and music history. So they'll understand the context of this and also how it fits into history. But also, they'll be producing music. So we will have a choral program and we will have an instrumental program and we take this very seriously. In fact, we have dedicated ourselves uh, to having the very best music program by the time we are a K through 12 school. Physical education is also not an extra, believe it or not, and all of your students will have physical education every single day 
of the year. Active kids are great learners. It's focusing on building strength, endurance, fitness, but also learning to work as a team, leadership skills, and all that kind of stuff. There'll be a recess, a lunch, and phys, phys ed. So there's a lot of kind of moving around. I know sometimes we think of you know, classical education as being rigorous and the kids aren't moving around or whatever, but they will be moving around, no doubt. Just to piggyback on that, we will have an athletics program beginning next year, so we'll have some simple uh, simple in that it doesn't require a lot of accoutrement, a lot of uh, stuff. We'll start off with basketball, volleyball, co-ed flag rugby. We'll have a club. Uh, we have somebody who's doing that. Someone has come forward and wants to do a cross-country uh, team, and it's a, he's a cross-country co coach uh, for one of the major uh, you know, high schools around here. Uh, so that would be great. And also, uh, we will have Taekwondo. We will offer Taekwondo. Um, and, and this will be taught by Master Kim from On AHN uh, Studio in, 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 in Blue Ash. But he will actually, he and his people will come to our campus after school two days a week. And that is an option uh, for all of our students. And so just think about this opportunity. We have the opportunity to have a classical school full of black belts by the time they graduate. <laughs> Talk about unique. I think that's, I think that's unique. Also, we will have extracurricular activities, and the extracurricular activities will be those that go along with and forward the mission of the school. So here are some examples. Junior Classical League, that's the Latin stuff. Chess Club, Power of the Pen, which is a competitive creative writing program. Uh, and a choral group, an instrumental group, like I said, service club, and we will definitely be having drama as well. Now, that doesn't mean that's the only thing uh, that, that we're going to have. Um, as the school grows and as we understand the interests of the parents and the students, uh, that will obviously grow. This is at least, it's not written in stone, but this gives you a kind of a good idea of when we will be starting and finishing. August 30th as the first day and the last day of school, May 28th. So the school day most likely will be uh, 8.15 to 3.15. We will be offering an aftercare program from 3.15 to 6 o'clock, which is like a, a monthly tuition base. Uh, and the doors will open at 7.30 a.m. for early arrivals, and then the kids can go to their classes at 8 from 8.15. 8 and then finally, the enrollment process, we are in the midst right now of the early bird enrollment process, which opened a couple days ago, last Thursday at 5 p.m. This period ends on the 23rd, and uh, there will be a second enrollment period that will open up January 18th to March 8th. So we have room for 400 students, right? Um, and that means if we have more than 400 applicants, there will be a lottery, and it's, it's not a first come, first serve, it's a random lottery. Uh, it's one that can be audited, it's not one that we do. Um, it's done by Schoolment, and that will happen on January 4th. Let's say there are 398 applicants and we have 400 spots, that would mean that the lottery would generate, everyone would win the lottery, okay, in this, in this first enrollment period. But that would also mean in the open enrollment period, there are a lot fewer seats available still, right? So uh, between January 18th and March 8th, you would have uh, equal um, shot at getting a seat. And the seats will be available by grades. I know one of the questions that you'll, you'll want to know is if you have more than one child, let's say you have a sixth grader and a third grader, are both of my kids going to be able to get in? And the answer is yes. If your sixth grader gets in, then your third grader will be the next one in the lottery who gets that, who, who wins the lottery, right? So I'm committed to keeping families together. I don't want you to, for a year to have to only be able to, you know, like have one student at the school and have to go somewhere else. Uh, so that's kind of, that's kind of built in.